Lord be with you. Let us pray. Holy God, source of all love, on the night of his betrayal, Jesus gave us a new commandment, to love one another as he loves us. Write this commandment in our hearts and give us the will to serve others as he was the servant of all. Your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from Exodus. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. This is how you shall eat it, your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Psalm 116. No, Psalm, yes, 116. I love the Lord who has heard my voice and listened to my supplication. How shall I repay the Lord for all the good things God has done for me? I will live without salvation for all the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people. O oh Lord, I, truly I am your servant. I am your servant the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, A reading from 1 Corinthians. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to John. 
Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. After he washed their feet, he put on his robe, and he returned to the table, and he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example, that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the ones who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. Please be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. When we think about it, we recognize that over the last 2,000 years, how we have been the church, how we have done church, has dramatically changed throughout the ages. For we all understand that the way that we do in our church now is much different than it was in the early church as we read about it in the book of Acts. The fact that we worship in a beautiful sanctuary constructed specifically for this purpose, the fact that congregations are named and incorporated and pastors are called with specific letters, the fact that there are committees and ministry teams and different groups that gather together, that there are hymns and organs and pianos and other instruments, all of these things were not claimed in the early church. And yet we have come to grow and understand and include them all as parts that facilitate our life of faith together. I don't think there's anything wrong with anything that I've mentioned, but we do recognize that it is very different than the first church of which the disciples were part of. But if there's one day, one moment in the life of our liturgical calendar in who we are as people of God in this congregation, and congregations of all denominations and traditions throughout the world, if there is one day that we get close to the way that it was done with Jesus and his disciples, I'm convinced that it's today. For as we gather on this day, we very specifically follow what Jesus and his disciples did on that same night. Gathering on the Sabbath, the Passover, the special day, and as Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper, upper room, we gather now. 
and we hear those words that Jesus spoke. For very few elements of our worship come together in such a connected way throughout all the generations that has never changed throughout the life of the church, regardless of schisms or reformations or anything else that has happened, we still find the same place that begins in our text today. For on that night, that night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus gathered with his disciples. He took the bread, gave thanks, and took the cup and shared it with others. And these words that Rob just read a moment ago from 1 Corinthians are words that have been with us since the earliest days of the church. Jesus spoke them in Aramaic. Paul wrote them first in Greek for this text. Luke included that as part of the gospel written 20 years after that. And throughout the ages, they've been translated into the language of Christians throughout the world to understand the connectivity between what we do here at the table and what Jesus first did. Those same words that Jesus spoke are the same words of institution that we speak today. Nothing has changed, nothing has tarnished or altered or done anything to make that different than what we have before us in Holy Scripture. And it is one of those rare places in the life of the church and in our litany and liturgy of all the things that we do together where we are still doing it so very close to the way that Jesus and his disciples did. These words that Paul writes to the people of Corinth help to unite them when in that place they were having struggles being the early church and understanding that class systems and dynamics would have no place there, that at the table everyone belonged to God and God showed no partiality. And these words have been the same throughout the ages, that whether you commune on a thatched floor or in a mighty sanctuary or anything in between, that it is the same promise and real presence of Christ Jesus that began that night that still rests with us today. And so as we gather on this day, it is important to recognize that the act in which we partake, the gift of God's sacrament of Holy Communion, as we will attempt to come together in a more intimate form, like gathered at the table, returning to the traditions that Jesus and his disciples did. And in this opportunity to remember that, we are reminded of how close we still remain to what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. This is a powerful moment for us as Christians to realize that no matter how big the church has gotten, no matter what we've added to it, no matter what sort of flair or design or glasswork or anything else that has come to help us understand who we are as Christian people, that we are still rooted in this gift that God gives us this night. But that's not even the most important connection that we share with this night. For what Jesus did on this night was revolutionary. It was radical. It was for God made present in the world, both human and divine, to lower himself to the place of servant, to take off his robe and to wash the feet of his disciples, young men in their late teen and twenties who'd been walking around and getting their feet dirty. And that job of cleaning feet was saved for the lowest of the low on the structure of servants. And yet for Jesus to do that that night, to wash his disciples' feet was a reminder of the fullness of the humility that Jesus shared with them and continues to share with us. For the words that Jesus spoke that evening that still rest in our heart today were not simply instructions and words of institution for how to gather at the meal, but a true commandment, a new commandment, that this is how they will know that you love one another that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. Think about what Jesus says for a second. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That act of humility, that act of foot washing, that act of Jesus taking on the lowest form among his disciples was an act of love that still resonates with us this day. And even if foot washing isn't part of our traditions or the traditions of others, we are reminded in this text that Jesus takes on the lowest place 
so that we too can be part of what God has promised for us. And there's something powerful in that as we see what happens in the days to come. Because the lowest place doesn't remain gathered around the table washing feet. Rather, the humiliation that Jesus suffers tomorrow that we hear of when he is crucified on the cross, there surrounded by common criminals, is a reminder of what Jesus would truly do for us, to suffer and to die for each of his disciples. To be connected to this moment, to recognize that no matter what church is and what church will become throughout the ages, that in these words that Jesus spoke this night, first and how we are called to continually and faithfully do this in remembrance of him, but not simply just to remember as an afterthought, but to use that remembrance, to use that reminder of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us to live out that new commandment, to love one another. At the heart of the earliest days of the church, at the heart of Jesus' message to the world, was a reminder that his disciples would be called and sent to teach others how to love, and that we are called and sent to teach others how to love, how we are called and sent to humble ourselves and to give of ourselves, to take off our outer robe, to be down on the floor and doing the dirty work of faith so that we too can make sure that others know their place at the table. As God draws us together this day, we are reminded of a powerful commandment, of Jesus' words that no matter how much you pay for your Bible, God loves us and God calls us to share that love with others because that is a gift of God's free grace. That is a gift made known to us at the table so that we can be fed and nourished to take that out into the world. I wish that I could say that this is the perfect place to end But we recognize that as we think about what happens on the rest of this holy night, as we start to pick up with those stories in the Passion tomorrow, we realize that the next few stories are all of Jesus' disciples falling short of what God calls of us. A disciple who betrays Jesus in his greed for money and power. Disciples who promise to be by Jesus' side and yet continually fall asleep again and again later this night in the garden. A disciple who has always been the one to speak first, but when he is threatened, takes out action and inflicts pain upon a slave there in the garden. What happens right after Jesus tells everyone to love one another, and by this you will go and be my disciples, is that the disciples show us time and time again that they fail in being able to do that. And we know that that is also one thing that has not changed in the last 2,000 years. That when we go forth from this place and try real hard to live out Jesus' commandment, that we too will fall short. That we too will make mistakes. That we too will neglect the neighbor. That we too will put our own greed first. That we too might ignore the violence of the world around us. And in those things, we need to be reminded of Jesus' love for us. And so in this holy liturgy of Maundy Thursday, we don't follow the sermon with a hymn of the day as we usually do. Rather, we enter into confession. And we come before God to recognize that as much as Jesus has humbled himself for us at the table this night and on the cross tomorrow, that we are in need of that humility as sinners in the world around us. And how does that story end? With a reminder that Jesus' love, first beginning at the table, that continues in the washing of our metaphorical and literal feet, and that is with us again and again, reminds us, just as those first disciples were reminded, that no matter how often we fall short, God's love for us never does. And by this, we will know God's love. It's a unique day in the life of the church when we find ourselves closer to the beginning of the story than we're often able in our lives of faith. As we hold on to that promise made known to us at the table and in Jesus' words, may we pray, may we be bold to go and love one another in that 
May everyone know that we are disciples. Thanks be to God. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us make confession to God. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a troubled and penitent sinner, confess to you all my sins and iniquities with which I have offended you, and for which I justly deserve your punishment. But I am sorry for them, and repent of them, and pray for your boundless mercy, for the sake of the suffering and death of your Son, Jesus Christ. Be gracious and merciful to me. Poor sinful being, forgive my sins, give me your Holy Spirit for the amendment of my sinful life, and bring me to life everlasting. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, for his sake, forgives us all of our sins. Through his Holy Spirit, he cleanses us and gives us power to proclaim the mighty deeds of God who called us out of darkness into the splendor of light. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. It is our duty, our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, whose suffering and death gave salvation to all. You gather your people around the tree of the cross, transforming death into life. And so with all the choirs of angels, the church on earth, the hosts of heaven, we praise your name. And we remember that on this night, in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. As Pastor Paul mentioned, you will be invited up. 
up in small groups to gather around the table for communion this evening. Come, the table of the Lord is ready. God of abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your Spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.